called Data Quality. Is it in your DNA? And my name is Deborah Langer, Vice President and Partner at DataSource, and I will be your moderator this morning. I'm especially looking forward to today's presentation because we're joined by one of our long-term clients, Aluna. So thank you, Jack and Chris. Appreciate it. Um, a little bit of background on today's presentation. Uh, Illumina had over 100 legacy systems managed independently for over a decade. They had to prepare for a global single instance ERP implementation and to do this in less than two years, quite the task. Uh, in this session, the presenters will step through the main business drivers associated with the data quality and cleansing initiative, the tools leveraged, and how to attract key business owners to support initial cleansing projects and a long-term data governance organization. Before I introduce you to the speakers and to data source, I'd like to first share the agenda and some logistical information. I will first take you through a brief introduction about data source and why we're knowledgeable in this space. Um, then we will have the presentation and we'll save 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. We have everyone muted to improve the sound quality. So when we get to the end of the presentation and it's time for questions, please submit them via the webinar chat. And I encourage attendees to, to please participate. Uh, we have found that the Q&A session is often the most dynamic and meaningful conversation. So um, please do participate. Slide two, please. Today's presenters are Chris Tyler, Data Warehouse and Reporting Services Manager at Aluna, Sally McCormack, Data Quality Practice Lead at Data Source Consulting, and Jack London, Global Business Performance and Data Governance Lead at Aluna. A little bit about Data Source Consulting. Uh, we are a consulting firm that focuses exclusively on enterprise data management and business intelligence. We serve clients throughout the United States, both mid-size and Fortune 500 alike, and we provide both strategic as well as implementation services. Some examples of strategic services that we provide would include vendor tool evaluation, assessments, we have a silver, gold, and platinum, depending on your needs, roadmaps, which are typically focused around data governance, MDM, or data warehousing, data governance business plans with defined ROI, project management, those types of efforts. Under implementation, we provide data architecture, data integration, data quality, data governance, master data management, and reporting and analytics. In addition to being passionate about what we do in our everyday lives um, as it involves data, we are also very passionate about our work outside of our daily jobs. Many of us serve on TDWI board of directors. We serve as industry analysts, best practices judges in data warehousing, and also authors of numerous white papers and publications. I thought I would take just a couple of minutes and share this slide uh, with the attendees. It, it happens to be one of the favorites of our clients. And I think that they like it because when you look at it initially, it seems kind of busy, but um, it really encompasses um, all of the different facets of enterprise data management. Um, if we could just scroll back one slide back to the, the previous graphic, perfect, thank you so much. So just to break this down for everyone, if you start in the lower left-hand side where it says information management, these are all of the pillars that you need for a BI or enterprise data management program, right? These include data integration, data architecture, data governance, MDM, data retention, metadata management, all of those important facets. And then as you scroll up to data governance, you find the business aspects, right? And all of the policies and procedures that are required to ensure that you have a very robust program, right? So these include policies, procedures, metrics, measurements, standards, rules, definition, and of course, for so many of us, compliance and regulatory control. That's the data governance piece. Then as you scroll down to the right-hand side where it says BI program management there in the bold type of color, as we all know, once we stand up a business intelligence environment, it's that initially it's a project, right? But once you have it, it then becomes a program because it's constantly evolving. It's never static. As we 
you know, have mergers and acquisitions, as we add new source systems, as the, the reporting and analytics demands increase from our business users, we have to make changes. And so you can kind of see how you get this flywheel effect, right, from information management, data governance, to BI program management and how that goes about. Um, so just wanted to take a couple minutes and share that because I know a lot of people really like it. Data Source Consulting has been an Informatica business and channel partner for seven years now. Um, uh, we've got a great relationship with them. We were one of the first partners authorized to do Informatica Health Check. And, you know, that has since opened up to a number of other partners, but uh, we were one of the first. Um, we've got certified consultants on multiple products, only partner invited to the internal training and launch of Informatica Big Data Edition. In 2010, we were Colorado Partner of the Year. 2014-2015, we were the designated Western Territory financial services go-to partner. We are the developer of InfoTools, which is a mass stage mapping generator that can save, you know, on the upwards of 30% with data integration projects. So it's a wonderful tool that we've developed that helps expedite projects. We are a sponsor of numerous Informatica user groups, including Denver, Dallas, and Phoenix. And we presented at Informatica World in 2015, so we've got a, a very nice, robust relationship with Informatica. So again, thank you everyone for attending. I encourage you to submit your questions at the end. I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton here <laughs> to Jack London to take you through our presentation today. Jack. Excellent. Thank you, Deborah. Good day, everyone. My name is Jack London. I'm the Data Governance Lead here at Illumina. I wanted to spend just a brief moment to talk to you a little bit about Illumina. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are the global leader in the manufacture of instruments and biological agents used in the sequencing of DNA and genetic analysis. Uh, we are headquartered in San Diego, have uh, a global presence with uh, well over 4,000 employees now. And uh, we are the newest member of the S&P 500 as of tomorrow. So it's very exciting for us. We're going to talk today a little bit about the, the project that we went, in, went through around data quality leading up to a full-scale ERP implementation that we concluded uh, over the summer of this year. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive right in. Back in 2013, Illumina launched a multi-year initiative meant to streamline our business operations. We entitled that Global Business Performance, or GBP. The need for this program was really born from the fact that Illumina experienced substantial growth over a very short amount of time. And as such, many of our business processes and systems really failed to keep up. Now, the initiative, aside from projects focused on process optimization and metric definition, a key component and, and really sort of the foundational piece of that was the re-envisioning of our ERP landscape. And ultimately, the decision we made to move from a legacy J.D. Edwards ERP to an SAP environment. Now, for those of you who have been through a full-scale ERP implementation, you recognize the number of pitfalls that can come with taking on a project of this kind, especially in the environment that Deborah alluded to earlier, where we have many different systems and a very scattered sort of technical landscape and architecture. From a project perspective, we wanted to ensure that we were going to go into this implementation with our eyes wide open, so we wanted to conduct a number or a fair amount of due diligence to understand why and how programs are successful. And we leveraged information like um, reports that, like this one that came from uh, Panorama Consulting. This was taken from their 2013 ERP report, and it depicts the top reasons why ERP implementations durations are extended. Now, taking a look at this, it, I mean, it, it, it seems fairly straightforward. Obviously, project scope, if you're going to extend the project scope of a program, you're going to extend the duration. Organization is a big component in organization change management, and these were things that we were very cognizant of going in. And then ranked third there, as you can see, is data. And we knew that data was going to be a challenge for us. Our data wasn't in the best shape. Um, we talked about the legacy systems, the number of them, number of source systems that we had to pull together. So we wanted to take steps in order to prepare our data for a successful migration. As a, as a company that's grown through acquisition, um, we had instances where we had a number of or quite a bit of data acquired from other organizations that we failed to integrate effectively. We had 
multiple source systems, uh, inaccuracies, inconsistencies across these source systems on things like descriptions, sales, operations data. Um, it manifested itself in a number of ways. We over or underbought based on bad MRP data. We shipped to wrong locations due to duplicate customer records. And we were constantly implementing change orders to correct and recorrect the data because of a lack of effective control. What this illustrates were a lot of the ills that our new ERP system were hopefully meant to address. However, you know, the old adage, you know, bad data in or bad in, bad out, garbage in, garbage out. We wanted to ensure that the data was in the best possible way going into the system to give our new ERP system the best chance for success. Now, we knew um, data was the problem. But the question is, how were we going to deal with it? Now, we explored two options uh, as far as an approach was concerned, one being manual and the other one leveraging a data quality tool. With a manual approach, you typically work with the business to identify the most critical fields. You develop some data standards or rules around those fields and go through a cleanup effort. Now, aside from the amount of effort associated with this approach, you're fairly, fairly limited in continual maintenance. Your effort is very discreet, right? You clean the data as of a point in time, and reoccurring cleansing activities require re-extraction of that data and application of the standards and rules to get them cleaned up. In addition, there's a fundamental flaw with the manual approach, and that's working with the business. Your reliance on the business to tell you what the most critical attributes and fields are in your data. And you're left to, ta left to take them at their word um, based on what they say. You even find individuals in, we found this quite often, individuals within the same department who consider different fields critical or have differing opinions on a similar field. Now, with the tool, you remove a level of ambiguity with the process. You're able to profile the data and then, in turn, tell the business what the most critical fields are. Furthermore, once the profiles are set and the rules are established, the tool provides for ease and ongoing monitoring. Now, to illustrate that, let's take a look at the funnel on the right-hand side. And this actually represents what we went through in profiling our material-based data and material attributes. We started at the top with the entire population of attributes related to a material. In our legacy system, it was 144. The first pass we did, or we conducted, was a review with the business to identify those critical fields that I spoke of, and this brought us down to 119. Now, imagine if we went through a manual exercise. At this point, we would have those 119 attributes, and we'd have to go through the exercise of developing rules and starting to cleanse all of these. Now, with the use of a tool, we were able to profile the data and truly understand what attributes are being consumed by the business and by the system. So what you see here is we found that only 68 of the 119 were actually being used, a 40% reduction. This obviously equates to a decrease in the headcounts and, and, and resources that we are going to need in order to support this exercise. After everything was said and done, we actually made it down to 62 attributes that we, we went forward with from a data quality exercise. And we were able to focus the resources on those that are most critical. I, I've, I've talked a little bit about, and I apologize I went through this so quickly, but this was really sort of to set the stage from where we were from an Illumina perspective in regards to our data, why we were moving forward in this direction, why we ultimately chose the use of a data quality tool, and now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Chris Tyler, who's going to speak a little bit about setting up a data quality project and continuing down this road to success. Chris? Thanks, Jack. So what I want to first set up is, is some framework around establishing a program at your organization. That was the first step that we needed to take. Um, since this is our first foray into the data quality space, we've been doing data warehousing as a team for quite some time. This is a little bit different spin on that, uh, on those efforts. Still involves the concept of a lot of data and working with the business, but more about setting up your organization for success um, when you go out and engage with various uh, partners that we've never dealt with before, quite honestly, uh, from an implementation perspective. So we felt it was really critical to, to lay out a simple framework and a simple uh, set of ground rules as we went out with the business. And one was first, let's establish our, our data governance charter that's relevant to the effort. 
define our target audiences, identify the owners and the managers of the information that we're going to interact with so we can be lean and nimble on, on working with those folks, and explain it simple, uh, simply, because this is a complex effort um, that's going to really cross numerous people with varying opinions on what they want to accomplish. We need to communicate how we're going to get it done, and then be able to move quickly, uh, much faster than we ever did on any of our data warehouse projects, simply because we knew there were going to be so many iterations involved in this as, as you go and look at data and you re-explore data. And then lastly, just you know, getting it done with the business, you know, what does that look like? So when we established our, our charter, we did it not from a holistic program, we, we kept it narrowly focused on purpose, so we had a messaging platform that could be carried out to the business. Um, and, and they can subsequently carry it out to their business partners as well. They're really focused on, you know, uh, on what we're going to do around this ERP system and how we're going to accomplish it. So it's explaining, you know, how we're going to minimize their risks, um, where we're going to implement these rules, how we're going to implement these rules, and what the ask is of the organization to move this program forward. And, and some key points here really is that we be, need to be mindful of existing business processes so we, so we don't impact them, um, as, especially as you're going from one system to another. You may not be enabled to touch that data uh, to affect the change that you need. So you may have to do things outside of the system, which we acknowledged right up front with the business. And that came across very well for the business. When we went out with the business, we had to make sure that we targeted our audience correctly. Um, we wanted to make sure that we talked to the people that had the most pain points, that had the most accountability to the data, and most importantly, who owned the resources, because it was about getting resource time from those folks and showing the value of the efforts and getting them engaged and keeping them engaged for the duration of the efforts. Um, and also, you know, in that communication, just making sure they understand what that process is and their level of engagement that they have to engage on. And then lastly, you know, getting your VP up to speed. This was, it, it definitely sounds like it's, uh, you know, it's an important factor. I think it's not appreciated to the extent where you really have to engage that VP and get them engaged in the effort and provide them continuous feedback so they understand where you are and what their benefits are going to be. You know, how is it going to help their business um, because of the resource ask. Identifying your, your folks. Get to people who enter the data on a daily basis and oftentimes report on that same data. It's, it's key that you understand who's reporting on the data as well as those folks that are entering the data because the opinions vary greatly between those two. So we really focused on getting a perspective on how people use the information. And one key area that we found there was when we're interacting with those business folks, oftentimes they would defer to the IT part of the organization. What we found when we, and, and we're in IT as well, what we found is that when we engage with our IT organization, we often got the explanation of how the system should work, but not how it's actually working within the business. And that was a key differentiator. So we really had to further engage those people that are entering the data and get their context of the information of what they think it is and how they expect it to be. And oftentimes those two didn't align between what the system was supposed to be doing and what the system was actually doing, and hence a lot of your data quality issues. So we had to hear that information firsthand from those business users and, and not secondhand. So again, it was getting the right level of engagement and identifying those folks that manage and deal with these problems on a day-to-day -day basis. So as you start to explain this program and work with these users, you need a simple way to message it. So you need to be able to explain what areas you're going to go after and what metrics of data quality you're going to focus on. So we focus really on the completeness, conformity, the consistency, the accuracy, the duplicates, and the integrity of all the information within, within the system, focusing on our customers, our vendors, and our materials as more of the key sets of data that we're going to go after. So some examples, we provided concrete examples that we knew that our business was living with. So for example, completeness of addresses, right? You can see here in this example, we have address records where the, the state and the country wasn't filled in, which as Jack alluded to earlier, affected our ability to both ship to our customers and service our customers, where we would have product going to the wrong 
wrong shipping location or we'd have uh, customer service reps actually visiting the wrong site to potentially make a repair on our instrument that was affecting our customer. Ensuring that, you know, maybe uh, that we had uh, full phone numbers as necessary as another completeness factor, right? That, that often got missed. Um, conformity, when we're dealing with conformity, we often found that phone numbers or zip codes didn't meet standards, which subsequently affected you know, how we shipped and how we dealt with our customers. Um, we found tax information where we couldn't collect or we couldn't uh, bill properly <clears throat> that affected our tax collection ability where tax rules weren't being adhered to relative to a, a geographic or a regional perspective that affected our ability because we are you know, a global organization. We found that we were following different ISO standards across the data sets that also affected our ability to integrate with external systems and be able to deliver information accurately out to our partners. As we were walking through, we also found duplicates where people were entering the same customers numerous times simply because there weren't rules or integrity of the system or people had different use cases of, of the addressing. So did we, have our, did we have our customer domain well understood or our vendors understood or our processes understood that would prevent duplicates? You know, why is the data repeated? Um, in some cases, there were legitimate reasons because there were different uh, data processing needs between different entities. So how do you address those? And then what was the integrity of the data? We often found that referential integrity rules between various attributes were not present, which also affected our ability to transact. And we've got some you know, examples of that where the customer ID was, was missing because of potentially one of those acquisitions that came through and we didn't import the data correctly into the system. Or a bad practice was put in place on, on the IT side or on the data management side that affected that data integrity, maybe an archiving situation, which we also experienced. So when we went out and we communicated, we wanted to make sure that we had a good communication platform that really set the stage for the business that demonstrated the process and the, the level of collaboration that was going to be needed. Um, so we could explain, you know, you are going to have to go through a profiling exercise where we look at the data before we start defining rules. And then as we start defining rules, we can start designing that, that process and the data stewards and the developers interact directly. So we would minimize the, the touch points and the overhead. Um, we found that to be effective in terms of our implementation. Then we would implement those rules, and they're oftentimes you know, the third, fourth iteration of the rule, and start to, to monitor the data. As we grow and monitor the data over time, we would come back around and we'd have to reprofile because maybe the, maybe the uh, data wasn't aligning to the rules as we originally expected, maybe the rule changed, um, all towards this ERP migration effort. Um, we ensured that our collaboration was, was kept at a minimum once we identified those key stakeholders and, and kept it to the key stakeholders and to the developers, and then we would communicate outward from there on progress based on our monitoring over time. When we said we were going to move quickly, it was how did we do that? So it was, again, it was starting with those base profiles, defining the business rules, building a process and reprofiling and starting over. What we found often during an IT project is there's this idea to go through much more of a waterfall approach of, you know, you need to develop something in a development environment and then test it and then promote it to production. For a data quality effort, we decided right up front early on that, you know, we knew that our dev and test systems were not accurate. We knew that they would be problematic with our data that would hinder our project. So we immediately only went after production-based data. Um, we thought that anything else would be a waste of time, and we did prove that uh, several times over. And that was very counterintuitive for a lot of our colleagues and from a development lifecycle perspective. But we found that to be the most effective method to get us to move quickly, to show value quickly, for our business and, and keep them engaged. So here's a, a little bit deeper on, on how we did that. We identified the, the systems that would be in scope, uh, the base tables or potentially flat files because some of this data lived external to the system itself. Um, we had to go through an acquisition process of our data and, and we chose several different routes depending on, on the use case. We went against replicated data stores of our source systems we had to build new simplified ETL um, rather than leveraging existing ETL because it 
that ETL was built for a different use case for our data warehouse as opposed to, you know, I only really care about the most recent set of data as opposed to all the history. So there was a new effort there where we wanted to build that so we'd have clean separation between the two systems because we might be running at different intervals of time. We would go through that base profiling exercise, which was a key step in the entire process, where we would look at what, what the population of the data was. And as Jack alluded to earlier, it enabled us to start eliminating a lot of attributes that were perceived important. And, and a good example was that we, as we went out with a the business, they would say, these several attributes are critical and really run our business well. And we would find that just off the base profile, and well, if that is the case, why is 90% of the data null? Or you only have a couple of domain values in those key core attributes. And as we started that base profile, and it really enabled us to start doing the cross-pollination of rules across attributes. You can't do that until you really profile because as you step down to the data, you know, you might have a domain value where it's got three values that are possible and the second field has five values that are possible. And you won't really understand those rules until you go through that base profile and you can enable the business to pick up on those key values. And then lastly, creating a rule sheet through, through the interactions of your meetings and your one-on-ones between your developer and your data steward, or oftentimes just the people that enter the data. And, and their perception of it. And then they would have to go out and funnel that out to their respective uh, counterparts in the business to make sure it aligned with their expectations as well. So for our project, this is really what, what the foundation looked like. Um, we would go through our extraction process. We would do our staging methodology, which in this case was, you know, some cases were incremental, in other cases is trunk and load. That's where we would just prepare the data for the raw profiling that we, that we talked about, and that was a lot of developer work. And then we would start the data quality portion, which we would focus really on the, the profiling and the building of the reference tables, which Sally will get into a little more detail on that, where we put in key values relative to the data where we can build rules. Uh, we would build our data validation and manipulation rules where, where applicable relative to those business rules because remember it was facilitating a migration, so we would have to prep the data for the new system. And we would flag invalid records uh, so we could go back and, and figure out what we need to do with the business. You know, did they make, need to make a change upstream? Did we need to affect the rule? Or did we need to manipulate the data downstream, potentially? We'd go through our transformation and look up processes, and we would, in, oftentimes, we'd have to bring back core data from our target system or what those target rules might look like to further facilitate how we would land and prep the data for load subsequent to that. And with that, I'll hand that over to Sally, who can walk in greater detail on the technical aspects of the program. Thank you, Chris. So this is just a depiction of the data quality process at Illumina. And as Chris mentioned, we first would acquire the data. So in this case, we actually sourced the data from a replicated database, and we leveraged Informatica Power Center to pull that data. And we staged that after performing integrity checks on it. Uh, once that was staged, we did a POC on address validation to determine what rules should be applied. And at the same time, we also did that base profiling that Chris mentioned. You know, we looked at the data to really understand what we needed to include as part of uh, the data quality process and what rules we needed to apply. And you know, here you can see that we continually monitored the data and continually profiled the data so that we could get an understanding as to what specific rules we would actually need to create. And after that initial profiling, we then created reusable rules and applied those rules to the data itself so that they'd be able to be viewable in the profiles and scorecards as well. Now, if there were any invalid values, as Chris mentioned, we would go and either update the rule or update the data itself, or you know, maybe we had to update a list of valid values. Now, after all the rules were applied, you know, again, this was for a data migration, so what we did was we then loaded that data into a separate cleansed area, where prior to that, we would then perform matching based off of certain criteria. And from there, we loaded into a separate area, which was our landing area before we actually migrated the data into SAP. So I'm going to go into each step of the process. You know, we discussed about this before. Why would you profile your data? 
you know, you profile your data to make sure that you're looking at the right data set. As Jack mentioned earlier on, we started off with 144 attributes, made our way down to 119, to 68, to 62. So really profiling your data allows you to see which data elements are important and where rules should be um, applied. And in this example, you can see here, maybe for a city, we would have a list of valid uh, values for a city, or maybe we would create a, a rule that said, well, you know, null cities are invalid, so we need to flag that record. Now, how do we go about profiling the data? You know, as Chris mentioned earlier, we actually profiled the data off of the production environment. We wanted to make sure that we we're looking at real data and not waste time looking at, you know, any dummy records in a dev or a test environment. And what we did was we profiled all of the data and as often as possible. We, we leveraged Informatica data quality and we started with using a physical data object or a PDO, which is just looking at the data directly and profiling directly off of the table. After we did the initial profiling, we would then create ETL to stage the data and then apply uh, the profile to an LDO, which is a logical data object. And the logical data object is actually just similar to an Informatica Power Center mapping. And we applied certain filters, certain logic that we needed to apply there and for the migration. So after profiling our data, we actually would then go into defining our rules. We had a standardized method of defining the rules as you can see up top here, we have just the headers from the spreadsheet that we leveraged where the business would fill out you know, who owned the column and that particular data element and what type of validation rule should be applied. And in this case, since this data quality was new to the organization, we had IT work on profiling the data and coming up with a proposed manipulation policy. You know, a validation rule would be, you know, is this a valid city or a valid zip code, for example. And a manipulation policy would be, you know, in our case, SAP, um, we had to create a special character. Uh, our source system actually had a lot of extra spaces. And so we manipulated that data and created a rule to create, um, change all those spaces into a tilde, since we weren't sure how SAP would handle that. So that's just an example of a manipulation rule. Now, as we're defining the rules, we want to make sure that we are keeping the manipulation rules in mind when we're defining the validation rules. So if we're looking for a list of valid values, and let's say we have that space where we converted it to a tilde, well, that tilde may be a valid value, so we should include that as part of our list of valid values for our validation rule. We also needed to make sure that we prioritize the rules. So we wanted to you know, deliver as much as we could in an agile way to the business. So we worked on a specific set of rules first, and then once we delivered those, we'd continue and work on another set of rules. Um, as part of this process, we also wanted to make sure that we educated the data stewards and let them know that these rules are likely to change. You know, as your data changes, the rules may change. And we also considered reference tables for a list of valid values. Now, after we defined the rules, we developed reusable rules within Informatica data quality. Some things to consider when you're creating these rules, we created separate projects for each data domain. So we had a separate project folder for a customer, a separate one for material, et cetera. Even though these were in separate projects, we did create global reusable rules that could uh, be shared across those projects. So, you know, the example I gave of the spaces going into a, a tilde, we were able to create that rule once and then just leverage that across all of the projects. In this um, project, we also created rules per column. So we had those 62 attributes that Jack mentioned for material. We created a rule for every each of those 62 attributes, but we were able to reuse a lot of the rules because they were generic enough. It was just sourcing a different column. And in IDQ, we actually applied the rules in the logical data object or the LDO rather than in the profile. Uh, we, we found that we ran into performance issues when applying the rules directly in the profile, so we leveraged the LDO instead. And then we output the result of the rule into a separate column in the profile. And here you can see that result in the profile itself. So the first, uh, the top half shows the profile and uh, it's for address information. And at the bottom, you can see the, the rules and 
the output of the rules. So here you can see that there were 38 records that were invalid. So the address number and search type, uh, city, county, address line, et cetera, those were actual uh, elements from the table. And the rule address validation was actually the output of the rule, so indicating whether or not that address was valid or not. And after the profiles, we actually created an LDO mapping to load all of those results into a cleanse table. So we applied those rules there as well, and we loaded that into a table so that we would be able to look at the results there and um, see if we needed to make any additional changes. Now, as part of the implementation, we also went into address validation and we performed matching. Here, we actually had addresses from US and Canada, as well as rest of the world. And we leveraged Address Doctor on-premise for the US and Canadian addresses, and we leveraged uh, the Address Doctor Cloud for the rest of the world addresses. Here, you can see that we started with um, our source systems, JDE and SFDC, and leveraged Power Center ETL to stage that data. From there, we applied um, the data quality rules in IDQ, and then output that into a cleanse uh, area. Again, we applied uh, data quality mapping for matching and output the match addresses, extracted that into a SAP-ready table. Now, when you're doing address validation, you just need to make sure that you are validating the correct data and applying any necessary filters. We also want to make sure that we cleanse and standardize the data first before we apply any validation. And then we also want to make sure that we're leveraging this, the correct address doctor, so whether it be on-premise or the cloud version. Yeah, after we validated the addresses, we performed matching, and here is just a small snippet of what the matching criteria that we leveraged in IDQ. You know, you just want to make sure that you're defining the match criteria first and making sure that that is uh, the correct criteria. We did have to spend a lot of time with the business in defining this criteria. So make sure that you have that clearly defined first before you're going into design and development. You know, as part of that, we also need to make sure to determine what columns we needed to group by and the weightage for each of these columns. You know, maybe the, the street was more important than um, the PO box number, for example. And with IDQ, there's a lot of different algorithms that you can leverage, so I definitely would recommend testing out all of the matching algorithms to determine what would best meet your data. As part of the matching, we also defined the survivor record. And um, here, in this case, we just flagged those records to, and let the business determine what to do next with it. We did not um, programmatically merge those records for them. And here at Illumina, we leveraged um, a tool called Skybot to do all of the scheduling. And you can see here, we this is just a screenshot of the, the process. So we uh, look, created ETL to stage the data, and then we had our profiling and uh, scorecards, and then our mappings to load the cleanse data and the match record. So at the end of the process, we actually performed uh, monitoring via scorecards. And these scorecards will actually let you know how well your data is doing. You can see the score trends if your data is improving, you know, or if it isn't. And if there are any issues, this allows the data stewards to review the invalid records and determine whether they needed to update the data in the source system, to update the rule, add any reference values, or maybe, you know, this invalid re record is valid and it's a valid exception. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Jack to summarize. Thank you, Sally. What we've walked through here today really led the SAP implementation. While we were going through much of our blueprinting uh, process and helping to design the system, we were working in parallel to ensure that our, the quality of our data was at its peak so that when we went in and actually started performing the data conversions, we had the right information cleanse going into our new SAP environment. As you can see here, less data equals less risk. From a data conversion perspective, if we can reduce the number of records that were suggested to migrate over, we substantially reduce the risk associated with the data conversion exercise. And as you can see here, we dropped the number of active materials that we, were, that we needed to migrate by well over 50%, and we had a, a a comparable or sizable reduction in the number of customer records that needed to migrate as well, too. 
this really set us up for success from a data conversion perspective. That way we could focus the resources on really the information that was relevant to come over into our system without bringing in a lot of bad or useless or outdated information. We realized greater than 95% uh, cleansed rates against the data objects that we ultimately ran through the Informatica data quality tool and through this process that was outlined during this webinar. We were able to increase the scope of the initiative as well too because of the improvements and the turnaround times that we realized utilizing Informatica data quality and we, we brought on objects such as bills of material, uh, accounts, and documents to cleanse metadata associated with all of those objects. We actually continued the profiling exercise well through the data conversions because these scorecards were up and we were constantly monitoring the data, we could course correct as we were doing data conversions, which helped us substantially and again, mitigated the risk. And finally, um, we were able to integrate uh, with uh, Address Doctor from an address cleansing perspective, uh, which improved not only the information coming into the system, but once it landed in SAP and going forward to ensure that on a continual basis, our data was up to date, cleansed, accurate, and consistent. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Deborah to facilitate the Q&A portion of the webinar. Deborah. Perfect. Thank you, Jack and Chris and Sally. Uh, I thought that was a great presentation. Really appreciate all of your efforts um, in putting this together. So um, we now like to open it up to the attendees to have an opportunity to ask questions. Again, please use the webinar chat uh, to submit all of your questions and we'll make sure we get them answered. I would like to kick things off. Um, you know, one of the, the questions that, that I have is, you know, in doing this, this type of effort, you know, looking back, what would you say was one of the biggest obstacles that you encountered? I'd say one of the biggest obstacles we encountered was um, getting alignment on what the rules should be. We often found that we'd have to redevelop the rules numerous times um, because as we'd add in more constituents of the data, they'd change the rules slightly. So the good news is because of our flexibility with the platform and because of how we decide to go up front with a lot of profiling, um, and as Sal explained, the, the disparity or the uh, you know, small units of work that we broke the rules up into, we were able to do that very quickly and oftentimes make turnarounds in a, in a day, which was hugely beneficial and it goes back to that mantra of moving very quickly because we knew specifically that we weren't going to get the answers right away, right? And it would take five or six iterations, sometimes even eight, uh, to, mm -hmm. to get there. Yeah, okay, great. Yes, thank you, Chris. One of the questions that has uh, just come in is, what was your acceptable threshold? What was used for address validation maps? Threshold, um, so from a threshold perspective, it, we used the native scoring capabilities that came with Address Doctor where it would rank the addressing into basically a bad or good and there's various factors there, right? Maybe it was the zip code, maybe it was incomplete zip code or partial zip code. The other thing you have to look at with respect to Address Doctor is the regional aspect of information, right? Uh, you would get better addressing in, in North America than you would potentially in Vietnam, right? So you really have to take that with a grain of salt and, and account for that as you're going through your validation processes. So in some cases, we might have to override, as Sally alluded to earlier, we'd have to override what address doctor was providing because the regional person knew better in some cases, not necessarily all, uh, what the address should be relative to their use case. And, and that's, to, to illustrate, it's from a threshold perspective, I think that underscores sort of the, the, the approach of, for those addresses that, for example, North America, where we had increased reliance on the information that was provided, our thresholds were much, much higher, you know, in the 99% rate, or, or, or percentile there, um, whereas ones that would fall into Vietnam, where we couldn't rely as much on the addressing service, where we had to rely on a, a local resources in order to help support it, we were a bit more lenient in the threshold that we, we allowed coming back from the addressing service. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you both for that answer. Um, what, uh, with the new implementation, what policies and practices did you put in place to ensure that you could maintain the data quality going forward? Yeah, so, so we leveraged a number of uh, the SAP tools that were available through the suite, the ERP suite, in order to help uh, reinforce sort of governance over, over our major data objects. 
Uh, SAP has a tool called uh, Master Data Governance itself, MDG, which uh, helps to control the process for the creation of change of some of our core data objects, material, customer, vendor. Uh, we implemented the PLM solution, which leveraged uh, engineering change requests and change orders to help facilitate uh, release of documents and bills of material. Uh, obviously, security is always a, a, a big thing, but um, we're leveraging the tools that we did not have available to us previously in our legacy systems in our new system to help reinforce the control and the accuracy of the data as it enters the system and as it transitions through the system itself. We, we look to our, our new ERP to help facilitate much of that. Right. Thank, thank you, Jack. Now, when you were um, about to start this project and you were investigating different data quality tools, did you go outside considering Informatica? Did you look at a couple or did you know that, you know, given your environment and what you wanted to accomplish that Informatica was going to be your tool of choice? We, we initially looked at a, a couple of different tools. We, you know, obviously went to numerous reports out there and, and re did some research there, and we did actually do a few demos and some different tools. We landed on Informatica for a, for a few reasons, right? One, because it, it fits within the landscape that we have from an architectural perspective. Two, it landed well with our resources and the resources we could acquire externally as well. Um, from a domain expertise, and three, simply the, the capabilities, right? It allowed for us to be very nimble without a high cost of development um, because our existing ETL resources could transition easily onto the platform. Um, and so we originally ramped up with just, you know, with the help of data source and one resource and then one internal that had, you know, eight years of ETL experience uh, under his belt, and then uh, another person on our staff as well also picked up the team. And so that's how we were enabled to bring on additional domains that were originally out of scope um, because we transitioned so easily from our existing data warehousing team onto data quality. Right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, um, I think if there are no more questions, um, then we'll go ahead and, and wrap things up. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, just want to announce to everyone that there are a number of Informatica user groups coming up. Um, we've got people dialed in from all over the country, but Phoenix is taking place Tuesday, December 1st. Dallas, um, they have one in December, but uh, they also have one uh, Thursday, January 21st. And here in Denver, uh, the IUG group is meeting Thursday, January 28th. So I just wanted to put that out there in case there are a number of Informatica folks on the line. Um, with that, um, we can go to the closing slide. Again, uh, thank you so much to Jack and Chris and Sally for all of your effort. We really appreciate your time this morning. Um, this presentation will be recorded. And so for all of those people that registered, uh, we will be sending out a link to that recording and look for future webinars. Uh, we do this on a regular basis and, and try and make sure that they're very educational and valuable um, to our audience. So we hope that uh, you will attend again in the future. So with that, thank you everyone for attending. Um, have a great day.